Cheers, sir. Dagan? Is there any franchise? Who's got another share? Is there a chair left? <laughs> no. Okay, good pull. It's the same guy. Simple as that. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if Britney Spears is better. <laughs> yeah. Just if it's full and we're ready, we can start, huh? Yeah. yeah. Let's start. Let's go. Okay. Okay. So the <coughs> almost last talk uh, before we can wrap up the day is by Laurent Eschenauer. Uh, and he's going to talk about uh, robots and JavaScript, which is, I think, almost the coolest thing you'll see today. Now you will see rabbits after. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much to, uh, to stay in this room all the way through. I mean, it's getting late. Some people, uh, I think, have been staying here since 9 o'clock. So um, it's been an exciting day for me to see JavaScript in action during the whole day. I mean, if you think about it, this technology was invented to animate a button or a, a logo on a web page. And you see it coming ready to the browsers with the genetics algorithms, so and so. So, JavaScript is taking over um, the world, and um, so it was pretty natural that JavaScript goes into robotics. I will. Um, <laughs> I will talk about the NodeCopter and what I'm doing in this uh, project. I'm, um, I'm a software engineer, I'm a freelancer, I mostly do actually Java for paying for the house. Um, but I also do a lot of things next to it. So this is really, you know, we're stepping back from the enterprise stuff, this is really just for fun. I have two open source projects on GitHub called Our Drone Webfly and Our Drone Autonomy. I will talk about the second one. Uh, the first one is a ground control station, web-based. Uh, so it's, it's a, an environment to control a drone through the web. It's using web sockets, uh, uh, H.264 video decoding in the browser. It's quite fun as well. Cool technologies there. But we're going to talk about the other one. Um, who knows about NodeCopter? Who has heard about NodeCopter before? OK, so I will. I will uh, introduce the note copter first then. There is this company, it's a French company called Parrot and these guys were used to do a Bluetooth headset and kind of things like that. At some point their CEO said, yeah I want to build a quadcopter and making a toy for 14 years old kids. You know, he just decided, I mean this guy had this vision and Parrot commercialized the RA drone 1.0 and then 2.0, they've sold 500,000 of them since the beginning. Um, it's an awesome little toy. You can find it in any uh, consumer electronics uh, marketplace for 250, 300 euros. And it's really marketed and targeted for, uh, I would say, yeah, teenagers. Uh, it's a playful, it's an entertainment device. You're supposed to do gaming on it and, uh, and, and do chasing with your friends. And they have all these cool commercials with kids playing the R drone. Uh, obviously, I have one. I tried to play with it. Yeah, you play five minutes and then was cool but not much more fun to do and and I don't think it's really catching up as a gaming platform it's, this is not the next generation of gaming <coughs> consoles I mean I've not seen numbers around that but another kind of playful kids decided to look at the array drone not so much um, to do the control with this mobile but actually diving into the uh, APIs and and what's happening inside the device and that's uh, Felix Gaisenhofer and he released a library uh, Node.js library about a year and a half ago at LXGS in Barcelona where he presented um, how he integrated or he built uh, an API to talk to the AR drone written in Node.js. And if you have an AR drone and you have NPM, you can just uh, get some modules and write this kind of code where you have a client and you just ask the client, you know, take off or rotate, animate, stop, land. It's, it's a code-based remote control. So everything that you can do on the mobile and the tablet, you can do it through code. So before, before going further, it's maybe interesting to explain how this is possible. Because you've probably seen a lot of quadcopters out there. I mean, it's really getting a momentum. Everyone is building its own quadcopters. Traditional quadcopters are coming from the uh, RC world, the remote control 
world where people usually fly planes or helicopters. So you usually have a 2.4 gigahertz uh, standard um, remote control. And there you are piloting an autopilot on a quadcopter to make it fly. And it's, it's uh, analogic or digital, but the uh, basic links. Parrot, because they wanted to do something playful and a gaming thing that everyone can use, went for another technology. They actually did put Wi-Fi on the device. So the Air Drone is a, a Cortex A8 or A7 chip, uh, so it's, it's quite already a strong CPU, 256 megabyte of RAMs. It has Wi-Fi on board, and it's running Linux BusyBox. So you actually can telnet into your drone. It's a Linux machine. It's a flying Linux machine. And in order to do the, the control with the mobile tablet, they created a UDP-based control protocol you know, running um, over the Wi-Fi link. So actually, if you send UDP packets to the drone, you, you can instruct the drones to, to do things. And that's how they sort of emulate this whole remote control thing, and etc. So this design choice, which is really a choice to make the air drone uh, usable on tablets and mobile device, somehow led to this um, un, um, collateral thing that that's, um, you can just send UDB packets to control it. So if you know the protocol and if you can reverse engineering it, then you can write your own libraries. And that's what happened. So Felix puts this out, hey, cool thing, drones flying. So of course, all the geeks in the room were completely ecstatic. I mean, you have to watch the video and the demos. <coughs> and it really took like, like fire. Everyone started to play with it. Um, suddenly, you can re replace an iPad by a laptop and writing code to control uh, the drone. So they launched this uh, cool concept called Notecopter um, with the idea of having one day hackathon where uh, thanks to sponsors they bring in a lot of quadcopters, they bring in geeks and, and people want to play with things and for the whole day they hack on the drones and at the end of the day they have demos on, the, on what they've been building. And you had Notecopter event all around the world um, happening. And they've been building plenty of amazing things. Um, so this is one picture of one of, I think, the first node copter in Berlin. Um, you see plenty of drones flying and geeks hacking stuff. And you can imagine how much fun <coughs> such an event can be. So people have been mainly, b because it is sort of a remote control API, people have been mainly in these node copter events replacing the iPad by any other kind of remote control in the world they could think of. So yeah, let's pilot a drone with Google Glass. No, that's what people have done. Let's pilot the drone with the leap motion. Let's pilot the drone through voice control. Let's pilot the drone through a dance mat. <laughs> Let me show you that video. And uh, today's a fantastic day because actually the inventor of the dance mat flying robot is right here with us today. It's Andrew, and Andrew is a... <laughs> <laughs> and Andrew is the is uh, actually part of the Notecopter core team. So if you have Notecopter related uh, question, uh, you can definitely uh, answer all of that to you. <laughs> so actually this drone can do flips, you know, that's and that's built in, in the in the software. <laughs> Four yeah, so. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, JavaScript, Node.js, flying robot. Lots of fun. But is it really a robot? I, when I discovered Nodecopter, I, I directly jumped from the first store, bought one, started hacking, playing with it, and, and found it awesome. And then the next thing I was, well, now I want this to be a robot. I want this to be something that, that can. Um, take some decisions, be autonomous, and do things for me. I, can, I wanted to look at uh, maybe even opportunities, what kind of new things we can automate once we have a flying robot. What can we build? What can we create? And um, so I, well, 
I'm not really a, a robotician, I'm an electrical engineer. I had a lot of uh, course at university more than 10 years ago on systems and controls and microelectronics and image recognition, all that stuff with very boring lab lessons that I never had put in application. And so <laughs> there was an opportunity to sort of refresh that. And uh, yeah, let's try to do it in JavaScript because the library was there, so that's what I explored. So to me, a robot is really a machine which is capable of doing complex stuff autonomously. It is not just something you remove control. It is something that has an intimate understanding of its environment, of where it is in that environment, which can interact with the environment, learn from the environment. I mean, that's, that's what you expect from a, a full-fledged robot. So for the next 30 minutes, um, you're going to have a crash course in robotics and implementing it in JavaScript and see that it's all actually possible. And, and really, I want to encourage you to, uh, to play with this thing. I mean, this thing is accessible today to everyone. Everyone today can play with robotics. You do not need a PhD and playing with very complex frameworks anymore. You can experiment it through the natural open source libraries that you, you're playing with in your, in your day jobs. So I showed you that Felix library is a remote control. You give a speed in a direction and the thing will go there. So if you just do client front speed, first command, it will go full speed in that direction, all the way to the next wall, neighbor, <laughs> tree, whatever. <laughs> what I want is go to somewhere and let me know when you arrive. That's, that's what I want. I want to automate things, you know. But to do that, we first have to figure out where are we before going somewhere. So that's the, one of the key thing in robotics, state estimations. You, know, you need to know where you are in the world. And where you are is going to, of course, depend on you moving around, but also external environments like the wind blowing and somebody pushing you and things like that. So in robotics, we call this state estimation. And well, if, if we don't get any information from the outside world, there is no way we know where we are. So the good thing is that in the parrot, next to this powerful CPU and Wi-Fi I told you about, there is an IMU, an inertial measurement unit. That's accelerometers, gyroscopes, uh, pressure-based altimeters. So you actually have good knowledge of your orientations uh, of the device, acceleration. You have good knowledge of the altitude. It has a ultrasound uh, capture to know also the altitude quite precisely when you're close to the ground. Um, and it has a, a bottom-facing camera, uh, which is used a bit like your mouse. It's called optical flow tracking. It's going at 60 hertz, it's comparing frames, and from the delta in the frames, it knows it can derive a speed in, in the two directions. So we have a very strong knowledge of our orientation and speed. Okay? We get that through the Felix library. It's called the nav data, if you play in this library. So when I get nav data, I can have a callback. And the nav data looks like that. It's a huge JSON. It's lots of stuff. But what interests us is that we get Petrolio XYZ. Bit of uh, aerospace stuff for introduction. Petrolio are three, four <coughs> angle uh, we usually use to describe um, uh, an object. And we get the speed in the three direction as well. So a bit of refresh. A distance is a speed multiplied by time. OK? <laughs> so that should be very feasible to you know, implement in JavaScript. Because I'm getting a speed every 20 milliseconds. I think it's a 50 hertz nav data. So every 20 milliseconds, I know my speed. I know my orientation. So if I just uh, do a bit of multiplication, a bit of trigonometry, I can integrate that speed speed data and orientation through time. And with just a few lines of code, and it's all on GitHub, it's open source, taking this stuff and basic parrot, this is what I get. What happened here is that I'm, I'm just flying the drone in a square pattern. Uh, so it's taking off from one point, doing three squares, and then landing on the same spot. You see that it didn't really track me. There is a, um, an offset. Um, but it's a fairly first, yeah, interesting approximation. From the nav data, you know, I can integrate the paths. Not good enough for me. The question is, how do we do better than that? Uh, you always want to improve. So the Parrot has these multiple cameras, so it's actually capable of recogn uh, recognizing things in its environment. Um, you could put a tag 
on the ground and the camera would pick up the tag and tell you where the tag is in pixel coordinates in its frame. And using this kind of information where you have features from the environment that you are well aware of, you know where they are and you can use that information to help you do a better job and knowing where you are. So there is a, a way to go in a detection mode. That's also part of the Parrot API. So the, the Parrot is doing that. Actually, they introduced the concept of tag for the games. So the drones could fly be behind each other and you could shoot your friends. And mm -hmm. uh, but we're using it a different way. And uh, you get input from the API, which is giving you um, pixel coordinates. So now I know which pixel my tag is. And yeah, OK, that's not. I would like to you know, figure out where it is in the real world, how many <laughs> meters from me, in which direction. So Wikipedia, trying to uh, rethink what were all these camera projections and 3D transformations. And oh gosh, um, you go to pixels to coordinates. Uh, yeah, well, you have to go back to linear algebra. You know, there's no secret there. You need to do some matrix stuff, but it's not too crazy. And uh, you, you can actually... Uh, from the pixel coordinates, because you know your altitude um, and you know the tag is on the ground floor, you can actually re-derive uh, uh, a projection which gives you the tag in meters uh, or whatever, in the real world position around you. <coughs> so now the process is going to be that we are going to predict where we are, just like I showed you first. Then we're going to predict where we, if we should see a tag and where it should be. We're going to observe with the camera. Uh, we are going to observe an error. Uh, we measure the error, it's a real distance, we know how far our prediction was off, and we can correct the post estimate. And that's a whole uh, algorithm, uh, which is called the uh, Kalman filter. Uh, here it's an extended one, it's a bit more complex, but uh, um, it's all doable in JavaScript, and it, it's not like 50 lines of, of code. And to do that, you need to do linear algebra. So you need to multiply matrix and vectors together, you need to do some invert, and actually, there's a really interesting library in Node to do that, which is called Sylvester. It's even, I think, a, a, a JavaScript library. Um, or it's a Node library, which is relying on uh, uh, native implementation when it can. And if, if the bindings are not there, then it does everything in JavaScript. And, and now you write linear algebra in JavaScript, which is not the most um, uh, exciting language to do that kind of stuff. Especially here, this is going to be synchronous. And because of nodes being what node is, you are going to block your I/O loop. So if you start inverting, transposing matrix, which are being a bit bigger, you hog your I/O loop and you hog your whole control, control process and you're pretty much screwed. So for this basic stuff, it works. Um, the next step would go to do with asynchronous callbacks. But yeah, I don't want to write linear algebra equation with asynchronous callback. I mean, that's, that's going to be me. So. Leave it from here, uh, here for a moment. So that's what I showed you uh, five, ten minutes ago. This is where we are now. At least we're landing back at the right spot. And we have a bit less of uh, deviation because each time the drone refly <coughs> over the tank, it's sort of recorrecting the post <coughs> estimate, etc. Uh, shall we do better? There is, like, the top of the top, the, the state of the art in robotics today is called VSLAM. Um, the idea there is to continuously observe your environment and do feature detection in the image. So you extract feature from the frames. And correlating features from one frame to the other, you, you can learn about your environment. And you sort of can rebuild a 3D model of your environment. Um, people are doing that in C, C++ with the robotics libraries. Um, I'm exploring, I'm playing with these things today in JavaScript. I don't have it, don't have a VSLAM implementation, and I'm not sure I can even get there. But uh, that's, that's what would be the ultimate step of what robotics can do today. Oh, well, good enough for now. 50 lines of linear algebra, and I pretty much know where I am. So let's move to step two. So now I know where I am. I want to go to X, Y, Z and get this callback fired. So motion control. Motion control is usually done with something called a PID. Who has a clue what PID is, a few of you? Okay. Actually, all of you knew very well what a PID is, because hopefully you take showers. <laughs> um, get in the shower, 
you want the hot water as fast as possible, of course, no time to waste, you go full speed on warm, it's cold, it's cold, eh, not so cold, well, I'm going to burn myself, I slow down the warm, put a bit of cold, it's getting almost perfect, the tiny little chip too warm, and, and you adjust. So, your control is going to be proportionate to how much far away you are from your target. <laughs> that's the P in the PID, that, and that's, most things can really be controlled just with this thing. And it's not much more complex than that. And just like with driving a car, if you are entering the highway, you go full speed. If you are entering your garage, you know. <laughs> <laughs> the I and the D are there for um, more subtle case, like you have this complex water system where hot water is constantly being less hot because somebody else is taking a shower next door. So you, it's, it's always, there is always a, a, a gradient, it's always going down and there you have to constantly slow down the, the cold and put the warm a bit up. You know, there is something constant and, and, and a derivative in your systems. That's where the, the I and the D comes in, but usually first approach and forget about them. Um, this is a basic implementation of a PID control. Actually, here I'm doing the three of them. So um, I measure an error. The error being uh, I am somewhere and I'm supposed to be somewhere else. So what should be my command? Um, and, uh, and I end up having a command, which is a bit of product there. And so here I need uh, three commands because I need to know how I'm going to move in the front direction, the lateral direction, and the uh, up direction. So I have these three degrees of, of commands possible. So I'm running three PIDs in, in parallel based on my input. And this is what it looks like. Um, so I have the drone um, hovering at one position and I then ask the drone to move to one meter, 1.5. So this is the target. Of course, there is an error, so it's going to recorrect by going, by putting its speed in one direction, so it slowly starts to, to move, uh, but then it's going too far, it's going to rewind back, but slower, and oscillate to the target position. And all the magic of PID is tuning some parameters so that you could decide to do something like this if you want to make sure that you never overshoot but then it's going to be less reactive. So you have trade-offs. You have to decide on your parameters. That's going to be depending on what you want to do. And there are ways and tools to uh, learn these parameters automatically and things like that. But for the basics, it it's just works great. So um, let me show you one first demo where you will see the drone just hovering above the tag and the, the the constraints I'm putting is that you should stay there, you know, stay at zero, zero, stay at your axis. And I'm going to push it, which will create an error, and the controller will react to bring the drone back in its position. Um, It's climbing to 1.5 or 2 meters. There is a tag there, so it's really reinforcing. And, and so when I push it, it's, the PID detects the deviation, and it will react to bring it back. That's just me. For it. So using the API you've seen, that's... Uh, yeah, probably 100, 150 lines of JavaScript code. You know, it's really all this basic stuff. And it's landing. Yeah. <coughs> um, okay, so, well, I know where I am. I know where how I can go somewhere. I will be able to uh, fire a callback when I get there. So it's already starting to look like an autonomous flight. You can move further. Um, so now I just don't want to go from point A to point B, I want to go from point A to point B, do something, uh, move to point C, take some decisions based on some observations, so I want to do something more complex and maybe based on what I do take decisions on where I should go next. So we need to be able to do uh, pass planning and things like that. So 
Uh, I've built this very simple API where you, you, you just do a chaining of a <coughs> commands, a few commands that you put in the mission. So here, uh, I want you to hover a bit, <coughs> then you climb to two meters, you move forward, right? It's doing a square pattern, and it's going back to the origin and landing. Yeah, so I'm just asking the drone to take off, go for a square, and, and land back. And with all the things we've seen, um, it should work OK. One digression. You've been building website for 15 years. You do a mistake in your code. The page does a 503 or whatever. You fix the mistake. You click refresh. Website is up. Cool. Yeah, not like that with a drone, of course. <laughs> Did something stupid. It's in the neighbor garden, so I know my neighbors really well. <laughs> That's when you're lucky, or I just decide to climb up forever. Um, the air drone stops when it stops receiving UDP packets. It figures out something is not going correctly, so it stops, uh, it, but it just stays there, hoping to regain connectivity. So. Not always perfect. But yeah, you, you learn to really write error catching code before doing your first. Uh, and, and that is so much, you know, we've got so much used to this idea of just coding what comes through your head and then, then see if it works. And yeah, you go back to a very different way of coding. You think through what you want to do. You write your test. The battery is only 20 minutes. So you cannot just do stuff and then take go fly outside and then iterate. No, you, you code for four hours and, and build something and try to find a lot of ways to test your code and verify as much as you can. Then you set up a test plan and then you go for testing, which is going to be 15 minutes, 20 minutes max. And when you've got that data, you can go back to coding because it's going to take another four hours to charge the battery. Or you buy additional batteries, which also help. Um, but it's a fantastic platform to play with. So let me show you the uh, autonomous flight. Oh, should I close the VNC? Um, choo -choo. No, this thing was I also crashed a few times in that nasty wall, <laughs> or landed on the garage next to it. So it's climbing. It's going to go front for two meters. That's the code you've just seen. You see the PID doing the adjustment, trying to figure out. It's going to go right. G3, it's getting OK. We'll come back, and we'll attempt to go back to zero, zero, and land. Oops, too far. We've seen the tag. We can correct and touchdown. <laughs> um, fully autonomous flying robot in JavaScript. Code on GitHub. You can do it today. Maybe some of the math you won't fully understand, but that's no worry. You know, you, it's written, or you, you can build on top of the libraries. And if you, um, if at some point you want to dive into the code, you can. So um, this is all part of the API of the Air Drone Autonomy package that I've published. Uh, it's available on npm, so you, you can just play with that. Actually, have frequent people contacting me, mainly people in uh, art art students. So there's actually two students uh, from um, NY, uh, um, New York City uh, school who are doing a, uh, a drone ballet or I don't know what, choreography. And they are not roboticians. They are just using this library and tags on the ground. So you know, non-roboticians can restart playing with this at very low cost. So we know where we are. We know where we go. We can control of that. So and ideally, we want to interact with the environment. We, can, we want to learn from the environment and, and um, take decisions based on that. So there you enter the world of uh, image recognitions. You want to detect objects and, and be able to track them. A fantastic library is called OpenCV. It's an open source implementation on a lot of the most famous computer vision algorithm. Um, it's written in C. There are bindings for Node.js, not the whole library. So uh, you frequently have to 
um, add some bindings, which actually was quite interesting for me because I, I had never taken the time to look at how you do C bindings in Node and how you play with all the, the WAF and all the JIP stuff and things. And, um, you know, deep dive in the Node C code is quite interesting as well. So uh, um, that's another angle I explored through this project. Um, and OpenCV lets you do plenty of things, uh, color-based tracking, feature detection, lots of filters. One of the most funny one or interesting one for cool demos is called um, a cascade filter where you can uh, provide a set of features you are interested in. Uh, you do that through an XML file. And here we are um, going to look for a face. A we do a face recognition. So we're, we are um, just using a filter to take a frame and, um, and see if we see someone in there. So through the air drone library of Felix, we get a feed of frames, uh, just JPEGs that we can process. Um, so I'm reading the last PNG, I'm running my classifier, and I just loop through the face is detected, and I just take the biggest one. And then I, I socket, I emit something in socket IO so that the, on the browser side I can do something. Uh, this is just a simple plugin that's enabled to do face, uh, you don't see it well, but it's, it's green line here, face detection and tracking. Um, and so, um, kind of scary when you have this drone looking at you and following you, you know? Mm -hmm. oh. uh, and this is the UI of WebFlight, which is the other project I talked about, which is uh, so socket IO based and uh, lots of other cool stuff. You have a virtual HUD and things like that. It's a plugin environment, so uh, actually the community is creating new plugins uh, to, to, to put in there. So I'm pretty much at the end of my talk. Now I promised you to make you all robotician in 20, 30 minutes. And you know everything you have to know to start flying robots. State estimations, yes, it can be made much better than basic integrations of things, but the basics already work for, for fun. And of course, PhDs are keeping researching that. Um, control, adjust the P, maybe the I and the D. That's enough. There is robust control theory and there is a lot of research in control today, but you can start with the basics. Uh, object detection and tracking, the tools are there. So now it's really up to you and imaginations and to create and invent new things, which will create new use case for the roboticians and the PhD to think about. And another interesting aspect of this is um, there's been all these node copters for the geeks, but recently, and I don't know if you, Andrew, were involved with that, they, they've started to um, do coder dojos for uh, kids. And so, to do the same kind of events with children, or 10 to 14. Have video. <laughs> you have a video of that, okay, so you can maybe show it later uh, during your, after your talk. But, so, if you're 10 years old and looking through technology and robotics, uh, back in the days, there was pretty much nothing you could do then Lego Technics brought some tools and some ways for kids to play with and knows they can actually play with flying robots and a whole new range of tools or so many open source projects out there and it's a completely different way to learn technology. Instead of first learning the maths and the system theory and the control theory and the image recognition and all of that, you play. And when you hit roadblock, you dive into the code and you get interested. Okay, I now need to understand a bit more linear algebra to figure out what's wrong there and to make it better. And, and you really go the other way around. So it's potential to completely change um, the education of technology. And we see actually a lot of programs here in Belgium with De uh, DevOx. I don't know if there was anyone from DevOx for kids in the room today, but it, uh, DevOx is now running. It's a popular... Uh, Coder conference, and now they are running uh, something called DevOx for Kids, where they also uh, introduce this kind of technology to, uh, to kids and children. So the one last thing uh, I wanted to show you, I've already talked about error control, actually, but um, is this thing where I, I took my error function in the wrong direction, and the drone was completely flying away when it was supposed to come back. And I, frankly, pressed Control c <laughs> It didn't do anything. Damn. So I've actually learned to catch a second exception in uh, <laughs> Node.js and uh, yeah, every Node developer should know. So uh, thank you very much. Just one point, if you're interested by this, um, well, um, you can find my projects on GitHub. The Node R drone library has lots of information. Uh, the SDK from Parrot, I mean, we can 
thanks these guys of, of putting an SDK and, and being very open and they've Rhinos are really embracing that community and uh, and being supportive. Uh, and there is a um, so I told you I had class 10, 15 years ago. Actually, I cheated a bit as well um, because there is Rhino a course um, at a Technical University in Munich called Visual Navigation for Flying Robots, and it's amazing because the whole course is online and all the lectures are online on YouTube. It's 10 lectures uh, course. And it will teach you everything uh, from control to Kalman filter to a lot of very much more advanced uh, stuff. And so, uh, yeah, I, fantastic applaud for professors putting their work out there for others to learn. Uh, thank you very much. And I have uh, time for question, I think. So, um. Yes, yep. Were you able, able to uh, test your software in like simulation mode or was it always from production? So I, um, <laughs> the question is about testing. Um, I did a lot of unit testing. So to at least double check my functions were supposed to work correctly. Um, that question would be more about a, a integration test where you use a simulator for the, the drone. Um, there is a an environment called ROS that every robotician is using. It's called the robotics, or robotics Operating System. It's quite a big, huge library. And there is recently an uh, air drone simulator on that ROS environment. So um, one idea further would be to hook my code to that simulator so you don't actually, you can play with it without having, so to make the code more accessible to everyone, you can play without having an actual drone. Uh, and also to do some testing. So I've not, I've looked at it, but I did not explore it. But that would be the way to do it. Yeah. There's also a, a clone of Minecraft called Voxel, yeah. and someone made a virtual drone that lives in the world, but has the same API as a node copter. So you can just copy and paste it into the, the console in Chrome, <laughs> and it flies in exactly the same way, but with no uh, idea of momentum. So it stops instantly. That's the only problem with it. Yeah. So what's the question here? Um, how much processing power and memory do you, do you need to re, uh, do interesting things with the drone? For, for example, if you have a smartphone with a JavaScript yeah. runtime, is it? The <laughs> so I didn't try. Um, I didn't try running it in a smartphone, but I think that's one of the interesting um, observation of this project is that actually I'm doing complex or what you could call complex control stuff, especially once you go into feature tracking or image recognition from the laptop. Mm -hmm. So the drone can be pretty dumb. And because we have Wi-Fi and good bandwidth, uh, it's the laptop which plays in the control loop. And that opens a whole new range of use cases. You can have cheap technology, dumb technology that can crash. You don't care that much if you're a research lab. And you, you can really experiment with the control stuff on the machine. Could you do that on a, on a smartphone? Well, you have, you have four core smartphones with GPUs today. So uh, I, I have an old crappy phone. Uh, but it's definitely something to explore. Probably all seen the, the demos with like the small cloud computers that are like extremely accurate playing the piano and yeah. that sort of stuff. What's, what's like the major? What are the major differences? Because obviously you're not anywhere near the position. No. A lot of these demos you've seen, especially one tech talk on uh, very agile flying robots, something like that. There are. Are, I would say they are cheating because they are doing completely different things. They are actually observing the drones from the outside using motion capture technology. So if you look carefully in the video, the quads have little white balls at the end. And they have motion capture on the whole field. And motion capture uh, then runs on, on powerful machines. It's very well controlled technology. So they know exactly the position and the orientation of the drone in real time. And that's what they are doing. It's much more difficult to do all that state estimation on the device uh, themselves based on a very noisy input you get. And that's why you have to go through uh, image recognition and vSLAM to observe the environment and learn from it. Um, so they are using a different approach, which uh, is interesting for different kind of research, but definitely not what I was looking into here. Yeah? <laughs> Yeah. No robotics at yeah. all. But like, I realized that when you fly a 
tends to glide. So basically, when you go in one direction, if you want to break, yep. you have obviously to compensate in that moment. But I observed, I was uh, looking at your video and uh, with your PID, the drone reach the position, and then he tries to correct the. the the position to get to the right right place. Yeah. So I just was wondering if there is any library that predicts the, the movement I need and, and start breaking in advance before to reach the position. So it really depends on the different you've seen two different behaviors. Actually um, if there is no tag on the ground mm -hmm. the, the 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 input forward will be dependent on how far away you are from the target and the speed at which you are going. So it will compensate to what you are saying. It will, it will slow down. Uh, it will attempt to slow down before, and then you have to tweak. Because if you tweak it too much, it may slow down. It's not reactive enough. It's it's going too slowly. And obviously, it's arrived at the good spot, but it takes uh, too long. Uh, it's a balance. The other thing you've seen in the video was the drone really actually going to what it thought was the zero zero but then seeing the tank so it's first going there then it seems like oh what should I had an error in my estimation no I can correct it okay and that's two different behaviors you've seen in action well, if no more question thank you very much Thank mm -hmm. you.